We did it! Alright, sorry. A little bit of a slow start today. How's everybody doing? Greetings and salutations, meaning of night. Owl of Sharp, Dark of Night, Star Pilot 6, Crisis, Farless 816, Star Pilot 6, again, John Huma, Good Nation, Travis Geeky Chappie, Kenichi Kudo, Post Status just reset for 29 months. Thanks. Good day, Amy. Good day to you. Thank you so much. I believe I just got an emote from that one. Zather says, doing well. The slow start. Let me make a sandwich. Welcome back to week three of our Small Gods Book Club. Here on Twitch, we are doing some Terry Pratchett. Bakery Dragon just reset for 11 months. Thank you so much for coming back to the Enthusi Army. <laughs> Arya Flame says, let me wake up. Hi, Amy. Hey, Shiny Marigold. Hey, Last of the Daves. Last of the Daves asks, hey, everyone. How we doing? How are we doing, folks? Um, I think we have a smallish crowd today, although I can't tell if that number's a lie. Uh, but I'm so glad all of you are here. Razio402, just we suffered seven months. I'm having a really great day. I'm on these new antidepressants, and they are working really well. Razio, that's wonderful. Congratulations. I'm so glad to hear that. I know the difference between needing one and having one, and having the right one uh, is a huge gift. Hmm? Colors looking a little brighter, huh? John Emma says, I'm going to miss next week, so I'm glad I can at least be here now. And that brings us... <laughs> Dark Knight says, it's the gods that are small. The book club is huge. Huh? Medium Knight says, okay, so there were so... I'm going to guess that so many killer lines in this section. Zathar just reset for 29 months. Healthy brain hype. Heck yeah. Taking care of ourselves hype. Vod Squad today is Detective Zen, Gigi Otto, Toothpaste, Lemon Twist, Just for Copy, Leia Sky, and Key Squared. Hello, VOD Squad. And someone is throwing an anonymous book fair. This means a whole bunch of people are getting subs in chat right now via an anonymous gift. Thank you so much. Please throw books in chat for the book fair. Farless816, The Real Brainwave, Morden Solas SCG, Musat33, and Fabri Kadabri. Welcome to the Enthusi Army. I'm so glad. Thank you. Uh, thank you for throwing books in chat. Hey, Gamer Reg82. It's two months for Musat33. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Sador, I haven't started locking key yet. Thank you for asking, Sador42. It's killing me. I have some stuff I'm catching up on, and I haven't had a chance to start it. The Netflix adaptation of the comic Locking Key, a book I really love. Medium Knight is nominating two favorite lines from this section. All right, from here on in, we are spoilers for Section 3 of Small Gods, a Discworld novel by Terry Pratchett. Uh, Medium Knight, my favorite lines from this section include, With your permission, Lord, I will write you more balls than you can imagine. And life's a beach, and then you die. Which is what happens to a couple of folks in this section. It continues to amaze me how this chapterless book divides so perfectly into sections. Because section one was the Citadel. Section two was the journey to and uh, stay in Ephib, Ephiba. Uh, and all of section three has been a return journey, essentially. Uh, it is the... As of now... Back through, uh, leaving a Phoebe, going through the ocean, and wandering through the desert. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on on Twitch, because it's telling me that I have either 70 or 7 people. Um, so I'm hoping this is a reporting area. But please keep talking so I know you're all alive. Uh, Geeky Chubby said, as well as rereading Small Gods, I decided to get and listen to the audiobook at the same time. It's both exciting and confusing. So the lake is asking about the last plot point. All right, we are through. We have wandered in the desert for some time, and we are about to meet our first living person in the desert. 
Uh, this is exactly our stopping point, is we've come to St. Ung Ungulant, a uh, friend to small gods. And that is exactly where we cut off. We're here. I see 70 on my screen. All right, cool. Morden Solis says there's only seven of us trying to trick me. I see, I see. <laughs> sure, almost rolls a stealth check. It's good, it's good. All right. All right. So, part three, what do we think? What are our big takeaways? We are really seeing at this point the development of Brother's thinking. Uh, and he has, uh, he has taken his... The journey he's been on with regard to his god and to Vorbis has been very, very interesting. Because early on, uh, the god saw evidence of Vorbis's cruelty, commanded Brother to go ahead and kill him, and Brother basically didn't out of fear of the immediate terrible consequences that would attach. Um, and we have now come to the point where Brother has enabled Vorbis's evil, is ashamed of the role he's played in it, but still not sure how to do anything, and has come to clearly a personally a, difficult to imagine at the outset of this book, the decision he's making right now, which is to go back and confront the structure that he was raised in, confront the Citadel and the organization that has been his whole existence up to this point uh, with the truth and not the double kinds of truth that Vorbis told him, but the new kind of, the, the, the actual truth, uh, despite it going this act of rebellion, and he's doing it in defiance both of everything he was raised in to, to believe and the actual literal voice in his head of the god that he worships telling him, to, please leave him in the desert. And he, I love that he's like, we can't just leave him in the desert. That would be, what, what does he say? There's a beautiful point where the, the, it is left to the god to point out it would actually be much easier uh, to leave him in the desert. Hmm? Kenichiko, I have two beverages. I did not change cups so much as I am drinking both of them. Uh, jumping right in, Medium Knight says, this may be uh, jumping right in, sorry, there we go. Uh, but I love how it's just stated that any large collection of books creates a warp in space-time. And it's just leaking in Brother's brain now. He's got a large collection of books in there. No space-time warping inside Brother's amazing brain. <laughs> it is amazing the way they connect those facts. This is also, uh, the books are, are leaking. Brother's got a library in his head, and the and I, ugh, the wording is so beautiful throughout this book. But when they say, you know, you can't read. You don't know what's in the books. And he says, yeah, but the books know. Plus, this section contains a lot of really fun Easter eggs if you have read the other Discworld books. I still think this book stands alone really, really well. How was your potato? How was your, I thought I was reading Potato Day. Um, and that's not what that says, but your name is very funny and welcome. Uh, I... Goodness, what was I saying? It was something about brother and the books in his brain. Oh, Easter eggs. Wonderful Easter eggs for uh, Discworld readers in this one. Uh, it being my first time through, neither the section about maybe going to Ankh Morpork, which is very exciting if you know the other books, um, nor the rescue of a few books from the library will mean much to you outside of that context. I do think it's still very fun and funny and you just accept the wackiness of it, but it's pretty neat when you've met some of those. John Numa says, what's the literary term for making a thing into a location? Like the way Ohm talks about ethics. It's like personification, but for a place. Uh, and Arya Flame says, like Fiddler's Green. That is a place becoming a personality, which I love. That's a Sandman uh, character. Yeah, Arya Flame says, this section includes Brother as the Walking Library. And Dark of Night says, to Meaning of Night, it's how I sometimes feel when I spend too much on Twitter. Too much time on Twitter. Too many ideas leaking through. Um, Shiny Marigold says, Brother is the best of us. Star Pilot 6 reiterates that the turtle moves. Um, I love in this section where the heretical truth from the perspective of the person who's telling it in this case, he didn't set out to smash any institutions. Uh, and he, when confronted with a crowd of eager, uh, uh, rebellious inhabitants, 
uh, insurgent type, old school definition of insurgent, uh, inhabitants fails to inspire them with revolutionary fervor because he did not intend to dismantle anything. He just knows that this is true. And as he points out, great Atuan does not care whether you believe it or not. He will continue to be a big turtle with a planet on him. Sunlit Lake says, I'm just really liking how Brother is starting to really value free thinking in a way that those who have it seem to not. Sunlit Lake loves the cameo of the librarian. Oh, Geeky Chappie thinks that mistaking Essex for a place is a riff on the joke about a place east of London called Essex. That sounds like you're saying it with a lisp. Ethics. It never occurred to me. Thank you. Bye, Razzie. I'll have good work. Morton Solis says the, the ape appearing out of nowhere and taking the books was very, uh, the narrative says that it has nothing to do with the story. Very funny? Is that what you're going for? Yeah, very funny when the narrative says it has nothing to do with the story. It's funny because I, I love this book and I read it as I've told you all before I read any of the others and nothing stood out about it to me. And now it's just like, oh, yay. Arya Flame loved one of my favorite parts, the ghost ship. This is now, uh... I think this is, is y'all, this is the second or third time we have seen someone, I think it's the third time we have seen a, a different take on departure from the earthly plane, and by plane I mean flat earth of Discworld, uh, and I really loved the way, the, 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 the sequence of the, the ghost ship. I loved the way that it played to the peculiar sort of form of faith that these sailors obviously had. Um, the way it's a little bit of redemption for the captain. One of the earlier people we met to be infected by Vorbis' evil, um, who gets to explore off into the non-existent sunset with the ghosts of dolphins, which I think is being here used interchangeably with porpoises. Hmm. Yeah, Arya Flame says, reality doesn't care if you believe in it. Gods, on the other hand. Meaning of Night, I really loved how he, uh, Didactylus, wasn't immediately on board with becoming the leader of a rebellion. It was a twist I was expecting. When he's like, I know this to be true, the information is out there, so sure, Vorbis, I'll write whatever you want. Oh, wasn't expecting. <laughs> oh, the confrontation scene. Sorry, there's so much in this section, I forget all of it happened in this. The confrontation between Didactylus and Vorbis. I got ahead of myself. Can we just talk about that? Speaking truth to power, uh, except not being an idiot about it, or at least his version of uh, speaking truth from a relatively safe distance. Gosh, yeah, all of that was this section. The whole library saving was this section. I'm hyper-focusing on the last bits. Who called it when Brother thought he had a solution? Uh, even though I've read it before, it takes me a minute to, to sort of remember and, and have it fall into place. So I get there ahead of the narrative, but only slightly. Shiny Marigold says, the leaking of books into Brother's brain leads to interesting thoughts about knowledge without context, learning things without knowing what they mean. Sun the Lake says, let's be honest, death is the best character in the whole of the disc. And I love the way it's different for everyone. Shiny Marigold says, yes, I loved the ghost ship and that ships have souls. Any captain would tell you the same. Oh, Mercury 83 is quoting some of my favorite lines from this whole section. When the captain is greeting a certain all caps using character, Where's Vorbis? he growled. He survived. Did he? There's no justice. There's just me. Ugh, it's, it hurts and it's beautiful and it's uh, so deep, but it's just three simple words. Meaning of Night says, I live for Vorbis's frustration when people aren't afraid of him.
Tiyama says, Death of Rats is my favorite character in Discworld. That was a nice little moment, right? The monster is now following. <laughs> the Miller squeak. All caps. Aria Flame. Oh my god, could someone fetch my tortoise? I liked the way that wasn't an exclamation. The running gag of the many times that Brother says God or my God, the way that we casually use that, and uh, is of course both usually intentionally and unintentionally referencing his turtle friend. Star Pilot 6 says, Didactylos' exit from conversation with Vorvis, <laughs> I love that phrasing, reminded me of the probably apocryphal, and apocryphal means that the legend has come down, but we don't really know if it's true. Uh, I'm all, saying apocryphal usually means it isn't true, but that's not the point. Probably apocryphal story of Galileo, who, after being forced to recant his theory of the Earth moving around the sun, supposedly saying afterwards, and yet it moves. That phrase, and yet it moves, uh, has acquired so much symbolic meaning and importance over the history of talking about these things. Rui Falero is now following. Thank you. So yes, and yet it moves, uh, I, I think has been laced as a reference throughout this book because I believe the turtle moves is, is a... A, intended to bring up that association for a lot of us. We've talked about these books being, many of them being sort of specific parodies where they can be really enriched if you know the source. So if your brain goes and yet it moves when it sees the turtle moves, it's working as intended. And that probably means it's a little less successful if you don't have that like floating around in your head already. But hopefully still lots of fun to read. Thanks for the host, BP Phantom. Alf Sharp can't help but see death as Alan Moore after finding out that all his comics layouts were paragraphs and paragraphs of ca all capitals. I haven't read many Alan Moore scripts. I think I had seen some of them, but uh, some people write descriptions in capitals and dialogue not in them. I want, I, I, that's a very, very funny idea. Loves the Sound of says There's No Justice, There's Just Me is also a throwback to book four in the series where we first really dig into who death is. Fuffy but liked how the captain was jealous of other people's afterlives. I love the idea of questing to find other people's afterlives as a sailor because it speaks to the idea that your idea of the universe shapes what you expect to find afterwards. So the captain devoted to sailing who sort of is involved in worshipping the sea will spend his afterlife exploring, but exploring for other people's afterlives the way on Earth you can explore for other islands, and that that's very in tune with who he was as a person and how he spent his life and what he believed in. It's just so cute. Hmm? Kiki Chappie has a, something I hadn't considered. Says it also dawned on me this reread for the first time that Urn is not only a play on the old Greek Urn joke, What's a Greek urn? About five drachma an hour. I've never heard that joke. I just know urns as a shape. Uh, but because he invents steam-powered machines, which, by the way, also happened this week, and a tea urn is a giant tea kettle used for providing for large groups of people, I had never heard of that. That's fascinating. Now, yes, the dueling what is thinking for, what is science for, uh, the way that scientists and philosophers were the same thing, essentially, in, in what we have of the, the ancient world, the, the classical sources that come down to us, were almost always people being like, I've written about life and trigonometry. Uh, the, the, that, as reflected in Didactylos and Urn as a pair, who both value knowledge, but have sort of very different ideas about what makes that knowledge more useful. The argument over what to save in the library is so fascinating. And the way that Urn has, by the end of this section, is confronting a very uncomfortable dilemma for uh, real th great thinkers throughout history, which is when you have a really cool idea and somebody over here wants to use that really cool idea to blow people up, what do you do? How do you handle it? Uh, are you okay with that? Does it depend on which people? Uh, do you still, can you figure out answers to the questions that interest you? And are you concerned that they might lead to, say, the ramming down of doors? Meaning of Night says, ah, I gotta jump out for a bit. First Pratchett, am loving this. Be back. Excellent. 
Goblin Wars says, I think I would have liked it more if I had listened to it earlier in my life. Dark of Night brings up another really interesting character because we find out a shoe drops regarding a, a side character who's been in this whole book uh, but comes to the center in this section. Dark of Night says, I find Simony a very interesting character. This is Sergeant Simony who we learned early on believes the turtle moves, hates Vorbis, and has sort of been close to him throughout this mission, uh, not revealing his true feelings until this section uh, in a very interesting way. I've known people so, uh, Dark Knight says, I find Simony a very interesting character. I've known people so vehemently atheistic that they can't stop talking about religion. And it's occurred to me more than once that people might have stopped believing in God if not for the existence of atheists. That's an interesting idea. Uh, there is certainly something very interesting to the way that uh, Ohm, in the body of the tortoise, finds Simony, who intensely hates him, almost as nice as having someone who believes he's real. Uh, because Simon is so dedicated to hating him that it's almost as good as believing in him in terms of the way we talk about when you really hate something, they are taking up space in your brain. Uh, now, granted, we also find out the source of a lot of Simony's conflict here, and it turns out, surprise, this book is also about imperialism and col colonization. Uh, because Simony is from a nice little town that wasn't bothering anybody until the Omnians took it over and basically forced him to be, uh, a soldier for their particular religion. So he's not a fan. Uh. And I thought that was a really interesting... After you, you get a little frustrated with Simony during the book because you know that Brother is awesome and Simony is suspicious of him. Even though you understand why he would be suspicious of random, extremely devout priests of the religion that he finds oppressive and would like to see crumble into dust. Uh, and I loved the, the... For me, I thought it was really cool finding out that, like, the way... We already knew that Omnianism, like, they're in the middle of conquering a thief during this section. But meeting a person who has, are, like, grown up in the system in that way and has that perspective on it is one of those wonderful, like, right, we should have predicted there were people who felt like this out there, but we just hadn't happened to meet one or think about them yet. The way that Brother should realize a lot of things that he hasn't happened to encounter or be introduced to yet. Librarian Liz loves the conversation between Ohm and the Queen of the Sea. The, queen, the Ohm and Queen conversation is amazing, says Librarian Liz. And a wonderful, those consequences coming back from earlier in the book. Uh, once we were back on the sea, you sort of forget about that bargain that got made earlier on. Hi, Excessive Warlock. I'm sorry we're spoiling the book, but I'm glad that you're watching. Says I'm so far behind, but I'm watching anyway. Aleph Sharp calls the, the ethical science thing the Alfred Nobel problem. Hmm? Shiny Marigold says Re Simony, uh, who is interestingly named after the practice of selling pardons, or it's a coincidence? I don't know. Uh, but after one of the more corrupt things that uh, from, from old school Catholicism that is credited as one of the grievances that led to people rebelling against it and the Reformation. Um, uh, zealots of whatever stripe are mostly a lot of trouble, says Shiny Marigold. As much as he hates Vorbis, he's on a similar path, I feel. And we're seeing in Brother the example of a, a fervent true believer who may, may escape this fate of zealotry. Hmm? Sunlit Lake really loved how this book doesn't just critique religion as a belief in God, but also as an absence of belief in God. It's just a critique on belief more than religion in a way, and not allowing for free thinking, even for yourself. You get me? Uh, there is a lot of... The book, I think, strongly takes the stand that figuring things out for yourself is, in general, a good idea. Uh, you see it a lot with the very first encounter with death, with uh, Freet setting out, uh, sort of saying, trying to kind of figure things out for yourself seems like a good way to go. And the desert looked better already. Uh, it is interesting because even the free thinkers are coming in for some criticism because the the, the picture of Ephib is imperfect in many ways. And this section also uh, includes 
a dig on them in the fact that if you ever find a bunch of people sitting around pondering the meaning of life, there's a good chance someone else is doing all the real work. So they don't exactly have a perfect structure either. Victor Kruger just subscribed! Thank you very much! Welcome to the Enthusi Army! Morden Solis earned what you could say, I am become death destroyer of doors. That, of course, is a reference to uh, the development of the atomic bomb uh, and the way it made some of the people involved in it reflect on their own experiences. Loves the sound of says, despite all the marvelous moral and ethical zingers flying back and forth in this section, my favorite, favorite one-liner here is definitely from the narrating voice. The Sea Queen had the attention span of an onion baji. I don't know what a baji is, and I forgot to look it up. Is it just, like, of a tea cake? I don't know what a tea cake is either. I'm just saying things. Food. A food item. Mercury 83 says, great, now I want onion bajis. Wait, do I need to look this up? Ari Flame loved, I thought you were protecting him. Oh, I was. I didn't want anyone else to kill him first. Simon E. Reeve Vorbis. Sunla Lake says, it's such a great line because at the same time, bringing up an onion baji gives you a different cultural and visual context to her presence. I feel like an onion... What? What are we talking about? Hold on. I'm skipping forward to find out that you all know what this food is. Oh, gosh, I'm so behind on the conversation. Okay, hold on. Chat is paused due to me scrolling. I'm just going to catch up on your wonderful comments. Uh, loves the sound. It says, Simon E. Wow, does he come out of left field for me in this section? One of those characters where you look back and think, yeah, I absolutely should have realized how terrifying you are a lot sooner. Um, people say the Pratchett has lots of thoughts on imperialism and colonialism, as we see in some of his other books. Uh, Zathra says, I don't believe anything Pratchett writes is coincidence. At most, it's an accidental reference. Uh... Yeah, I'm catching up, catching up, catching up. Uh. Some of Lake wonders how this book is viewed from people of a different cultural viewpoint. Because, yes, there's a lot of Church of England here. Uh, and British colonialism, but our ignorance of it, says Sunlit Lake, who is speaking from an inside perspective there. Uh. Morden Solis says the part where the sea goddess gets distracted by the other ship and sinks it instead is pretty funny and I think says something about the chaotic nature of life. I think that's one of the most brilliant pieces in here because it's all completely in character as established and there's nothing exactly fair about laws of revenge anyway and it so it both conveniently saves a bunch of characters we liked but it doesn't feel cheap because this world is that painful and cruel that those other people had to die for just no reason even though as we know in fact they are the ship that was involved in the original crime that the other ship was going to get punished for so everything there's no justice there's only me huh? it's an indian appetizer with onion and lentil flour mixed and deep fried that sounds amazing Dark Knight loves the chat has now become a pure foodie discussion. Thank you. Okay, I'm caught up. Uh... Hey, Victor Kruger says thank you, and thank you for posting your VODs to this on YouTube, which brought me here. I've been reading, listening to the Discworld series for over 15 years. I have the last book to go, but I don't have the strength to do it. I understand. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, I'm very, now I'm hungry, <laughs> um, because I love Indian food, but apparently I don't know all of the things that it can include. Right, so the lake says, uh, feels like a cultural thing here, because, like, it hadn't occurred to me that people wouldn't know what an onion bhaji is. It's like saying you don't know what, is, what stir fry is. But I'm also, I get samosas 100% of the time I go to Indian food, so I probably have never tried a different appetizer.
so yes, we have, this book club has been so much fun because we have a mix of uh, people who've read many, many Pratchett's and people for whom this is the first one. Do we have any uh, particular thoughts from folks whose first Pratchett this is? I know what Meaning of Night has a duck out, but... Uh... Los Sana says, in Britain, I think in Britain we have so many bastardized versions of so many different cultural foods that we kind of think anyone who's ever had a curry would know what a bhaji is, etc. Oh, now we're uh, having a discussion of people reading their last books. Unfortunately, of course, Terry Pratchett is no longer with us. Uh... There have been some wonderful organizations raising money to fight Alzheimer's in his name. Uh, and hopefully the books that he's put into the world are going to continue to do good for many, many people for many, many years. And we keep his name alive when we speak it. Uh, but there, there's folks are saying, uh, Mgeta says, I have started the last book three times, have not finished it. Hmm? Aria Flame liked the introduction of the small gods. Yes, after hearing about them throughout this book, we finally land. It, it is, it's wonderful. The book is so rich in the way that it mentions things, and you realize, like, as simony and the desert are two things that have been planted throughout this book that just sort of flourish in this section. Uh... We've been hearing all about the desert and the heart of the desert where the voices whisper, and we finally get to them, and, uh... Ohm is fiercely defending brother from the the, the, the many desert voices. Uh, which, even though he's doing it in his own self-interest, feels very noble. It feels like he's fending off a pack of wild dogs. Uh, hi, Geek and Sundry. How's it going? John Numa says, as a first-timer, I found the discussion of technology in this section really interesting, especially since I assume that feature develops in future books. Alice Sharp is now hosting. Thank you very much. Andy Ford says, I've really enjoyed it. It reminds me of the Hitchhikers to the Galaxy in the best way. Two of my very favorite things. Yep. Oh, Doug of Nate says Terry's no longer with us because there's no justice, only, well, you know. Hmm, never thought to put that together. <sighs> Sunlight Lake loves the penguin! Yes, we get the official explanation for the penguin in this one. Belief matters. It shapes things. One sculptor doesn't know what an owl looks like. Uh, and now the goddess of wisdom carries a penguin. Librarian Liz says voices in the desert is also very high in religious symbolism. A lot of wandering in the desert and receiving visions and uh, talking to people um, in, in some of the origins of major our world religions. Yes, yeah, Starpilot 6 liked the goddess Patina uh, carrying a penguin because of one sculpture. It only ever had an owl described to him and made a mess of it. Farla says, yeah, this is my first one. I'm looking forward to reading more. Namilla says, Pratchett doesn't need to pick the desk world as a changing place. Aria Flame uh, is asking about the, the desert lion. I thought was a very interesting point. Uh, lion, is it a reference to literary reference of the lion with a thorn in its paw? That's definitely how I take it. Uh, partly because Brother is just sort of generally a good and compassionate person, except for that one cave snake. Uh, um... <laughs> But, uh, you know, he's got to live. Uh, but, yeah, when, when confronted with a, a danger, he takes the spear out of the lion's side. Uh, and uh, as he is lugging along Vorbis, the most evil, dangerous man on the planet, but whom he refuses to let die uh, if it's up to him. Uh, it is amazing to watch it play out on those levels and hope it, you know, doesn't backfire on him like good deeds occasionally do. Ha! 
Loving Bud says, I'm glad this chat only focuses on the food and never gets to the carnal thoughts. Yeah, brother gets his first uh, temptations in this section. And he's getting very sassy with his god, as if you may have noticed. Ah, Aleph Sharp, again, from someone who's a member of a religion that's not Christianity, but is still considered a major, not sure what that means, religion. The points feel weird, as mentioned previously, but now seeing the opposite side of that aisle uh, with simony is interesting to see, having expected him to be more of a blunt soldier flunky using religion as a bludgeon, but he ends up being a character who's using his views on those that hurt him, getting to view every religion as the same. Right, because... Because his people were victimized by one religion, he hates the idea of gods. He's just gone all the way there. Mercury83 says the lion's opinion on discarding good protein was great. Morton Solo says, snakes are symbolic in some religions, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some Lake says, baby's first temptations with a heart for brother. Fuffy Butt says, with knowledge comes sass, which is actually kind of the subtext of a lot of this section. Tar Dark of Nate loved, tortoises are easy to believe in. And some Lake and Dark of Nate are now discussing Ohm as a warlock patron. Oh, my gosh. Shiny Marigold quotes, Brother, we don't just throw people to the lions. Ohm, he does. Brother, yes, I don't. And that's the book right there. Arya Flame also says, this is how they do it in ethics? Don't know. It's how I'm doing it. Oh, which chokes me up just to read. Pact of the Tortoise. Farla says, eh, we've all had our athe edgy atheist phase. Many people have. Hmm? As Elfshar points out, not yet. I haven't. Hmm? The truth is many, many good people go through with their lives remaining uh, believers in one or more religions. It's one of the things I want to be careful with this is that this book probably plays very well to someone uh, who grew up surrounded by one specific religion, rebelled against it, uh, and and hasn't yet encountered a lot of other things. Um, I think that the book also has tons of beautiful humanistic points to say if you do come at it from other traditions, but again, I haven't had much of a chance to find out. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate folks like Aleph who are bringing in those other perspectives of how it lands if you're not like, ah, Church of England, got it. Yeah, Shiny Marigold says, as I said, brother is the best of us. Dark of Night says, be the brother you want to see in the world. Brother's also a really interesting example of someone who... There's, we, ha we debate a lot about, do you bear guilt if you participate in a system you don't really realize is going on? It's one of the things we talk about when we talk about the concept of privilege. If it's helping you, whether or not you know it is and whether or not you want it to, how does that? what does that mean to you as a person? And people can get derailed by trying to figure out does that mean I'm guilty? As if you have to have intentionally done it for it to be involved. And that's sort of, you get to a place where you realize that's not the important question. The question is, what will you do now? Now that you know, now that you understand that you're part of this, what choices will you make? Uh, and you have to answer that for yourself, just the way the brother has to answer for himself. What will he do now that he's starting to understand things he never did about this system? Doesn't mean his grandma's evil. You know what I mean? She raised him with love in this system and passed down, I mean, you know, she was apparently a very strict disciplinarian, so she might, that's a separate question. But what I love about this book is that it rolls all of that together and it shows you someone who is saying, I have new information, here's what I will do now. Is it the right thing? I don't know, but it's what I'm trying. John Numa says, hey, also hasn't had that phase, but boy, have my faith has, yeah, not me, but boy, has my faith changed a lot, multiple times.
Farla says, I don't even know what my perspective is, which is totally fair. I was raised uh, first in Methodist and Episcopal churches and then just sort of drifted away from it in the way that a lot of people do and have sort of landed in what I would generally consider an agnostic place. Um, Librarian Liz says, th Librarian Liz says the thing is the book doesn't feel atheist. It makes Ohm deserve brother and reorients the focus, but brother's belief is so important. You know? It's certainly, it's difficult to get to this point of the, like, you can't see it as a bad thing the brother believes in Ohm. Ohm is real. Ohm means something to brother, and brother's belief is beautiful. And we're having a wonderful side discussion. Apparently there was a Discworld GURPS game. Loves the sound of things. The Discworld might suit a system like Powered by the Apocalypse because it's so narrative heavy. Uh, the, the Warlock Patron discourse has uh, expanded into some beautiful RPG talk. Shiny Marigold loves how Brother's starting to hold Ohm accountable for his lack of actions regarding his believers. <laughs> Morton Sola says his grandmother is definitely evil. Eh. Bakery Dragon says so much yes to empathy and meaningful action going forward. Farla says I was just kidding around before. Obviously everyone's got their own experiences. Shiny Marigold says, brother tells Ohm he is, in fact, responsible for what his believers do in his name. And I'm not going to lie, I was pretty done with Ohm by the end of this section. Aww. Dark of Nate is commenting on being raised Catholic. Uh, says, while I'm no longer practicing, it definitely forms a lot of my character and the lenses I view the world through, both the parts I agree with and the parts I don't. Zather likes the way beliefs shape belief shapes gods in Discworld. Our beliefs definitely shape the way we perceive the world. Victor Kruger says it's very difficult to consider any Discworld books as atheist books when the gods play such important roles in many of the books. Well, yeah, the sea god just killed a bunch of people. Sea goddess just killed a bunch of people, so she's definitely real. Sun the Lake brings up a, a criminal connection. Kind of reminds me a wee bit about Percy and Critical Role. You can't not believe in the gods. They're real for that stance but you can question them from there and find your role in the world and how god plays in it you get me uh that reminds me wonderfully of the uh the free thinker in a who is determined to commit to atheism and people have stopped standing next to him because of getting struck by lightning all the time bakery dragons headed to bed but glad to have been here for a bit and looking forward to watching the rest in vod gazone y'all gazone bakery dragon Loves the sound of says, th oh, here's something I loved and forgot. The way the small god who had once been a great god speaks. Oh, oh, that part. I don't have the book in front of me, but the repeated phrases and the repeated I, 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 clinging on to the sense of a self as the last thing this god has as its memory crumbles. Y'all, that, the, the, the formerly great god was a truly heartbreaking part. And it's why I can never really be off board with Ohm because Ohm is getting the crap scared out of him right now. Uh, having met his potential future. Aleph Sharp. A lot of this book reminds me of one really famous, within Judaism at least, story. Paraphrasing. There's a few rabbis arguing over if something is kosher. One rabbi says, if I am right, let the river show it. And the river runs in reverse. But the others say, the river has no bearing on religious law. Then the rabbis say, if I am right, let the trees show it. And the trees bend toward the synagogue. The rest say, trees know as much as rivers. There is no reason to follow them. Uh, we'll resume with it. It looks like the rest of your comment got cut off, Aleph. Um, so I apologize in advance for mucking up the delivery, but I'll happily read the second part in when it comes. Librarian Liz says, I've never been religious, but the openness of my friends' Jewish temples and Quaker meetings make me very respectful and appreciative of the wondering community that can be found in religion. Lang Tang says, I've never once been struck by lightning. <laughs> Be careful how you throw that around if you land on Discworld. Gamer Roger says, Granny, ha uh, this is Granny Weatherwax, one of the main characters of the Witches books, my faves, by the way, uh, has a great bit on gods. They exist like a table. You don't believe in it because it's real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fuffy 
Charlie Butt points out that Ohm found water in the desert and protected Brother from a thousand voices that would lead him astray. Ohm is finally acting like a god. And it's funny because it's Ohm is doing things a turtle can do. Like Ohm can dig. Ohm can't smite a rock right now, but a turtle can a tortoise can dig and he digs. Uh and he can just stand there yelling as one little voice at the other gods, but it's enough. So he's being shaped. We all, we learned about the sort of the power of the shape to imbue him with qualities. So he's doing things in tortoisey ways. But you're right, Puffy Butt. They're very godlike uh, actions. Shiny Marigold uh, thought it was interesting to me how the information leaking into Brother's head, combining combined with his upbringing, resulted in ethics being added to religious belief. Uh, I'm gonna say they aren't the same. I was gonna say, and that's another thing the book talks about. Fields, Namillus. Dark of Nate says, Brother is literally surviving the desert only by the intervention of his god. It's so funny. In a, in a book about sort of how false and fake the giant thing is, they are having a very traditional sort of prophet-god relationship. Sunlit Lake says, I think that I was raised where and when I was. I was raised Baptist, but my lunch table at school was much more diverse. Different sects of Islam, his Christianity, Hindu, atheist. I ended up coming to the conclusion that none of us are 100% and anyone who says so isn't. Um, the, the level of dirtiness of that word may vary. Uh, a prat is what I'm going to say, which hopefully isn't worse somehow. Um, but very funny. <laughs> I am also very glad that I got to meet a lot of folks who were raised in different traditions than me very early. Um, but we all have a lot to learn, too. <laughs> oh my gosh, the suggested related uh, replacement terms. Uh, a pillock, a numpty, a dingus. Oh, thank you very much. Aria Flame says, it's very mild in the UK. That's about equivalent. Ah, uh, all right. So, the library is gone, except the library isn't gone, and we kind of need Brother to maybe live long enough to write some of this stuff down, because he's got an entire library in his head now. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. I do want to, we skipped uh, the middle, the middle encounter with death in this section, which I, again, forgot was in this section. Uh... I really, really love, because Private Iklos uh, is the second person that we see encountering death. It is right around the time that Simony is entering the narrative, that Sergeant Simony is entering the narrative in a more major way. And I love the way that it happens, because they take a classic adventure book moment. Uh, our heroes are about to be struck down, uh, or someone we like is about to be struck down uh, by a faceless bad guy number seven minion uh but crucially at the last moment they are saved by intervention and the narrative usually carries forward with either heroes or the intervener right the narrative almost never stops to take a moment to tell you about henchman minion number seven uh what he believed in and what becomes of him and what could lead him to the choice we obviously hate the decision to to potentially kill one of the people on our side uh it's not a sympathetic way to meet a character and yet you immediately understand who this person is and how they came to be how they are uh and, and to the extent that as they set off on the whole it could have been worse is the most sweet sad sort of lovely uh way to go out librarian list says can i just pause for a second for poor brother's brain Cosmic Voyager, hello! And whatever the librarian couldn't get to in time, says Victor Cougar. 
Zathra says, the whole thing about books knowing what they mean and having a power of their own is in some ways just a part of the Discworld ever since the Light Fantastic, but it's also a nice thing here just for the thematic element of Brother's personal growth. Selda likes his brother needs a hug. Arya Flame liked that Didactylos was the one who burned the library. <laughs> and Denapt, says Selda like. Kiki Chappie says, like a lot of British swear words, the origins of the word, the, the word I edited out there was twat. Pretty strong, but from being used for centuries, it has become watered down into something you can say in front of your granny without fear. Dark of Nate says, not gonna lie, I love any narrative that gives me background on random henchman number seven. Ah, part two of the, the, the story from Al of Sharp. So then he says, if I'm right, let the walls show it. And the walls start bending into the shul or synagogue. The rest say, there's no proof min walls. Miracles can't determine halasha. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that. Jewish religious law. So finally he says, if I'm right, I'm not sure how to say do this out loud because you put the thing. If I'm right, let the one above say I am right. And a voice calls out and says that he is right. But the rest of them say, the one above gave the laws and morals to us. So even his opinion doesn't override ours as the one above isn't the one who lives and has to follow them. <laughs> I think I've heard a version of this story. Hmm? I'm excited it, uh, if there's a... Hmm? And they agree. <laughs> uh, that, that's a fantastic story, Olive Sharp. And anticipates the way that a lot of arguing about what things mean uh, is essentially inherited from folks who were getting there very early on, such as the, uh, Judaism, where there is an incredibly long tradition of arguing uh, over what things mean and productively passing that forward. Mikey Glinsky says, hey all, I'm not 100% audio only today, but I'm swapping gravel in a fish tank. Gravel in a fish tank, so it's essentially the same. Can't wait for the conversation, and yay turtles. <laughs> Gemini Lightning says, library is gone, yet isn't gone? Are we back with Bodhes? We are! Is it infinite if it bends space-time and exists in the future and also in his head? Drama says, sometimes while reading Song of Ice and Fire, it feels like you're reading a story of Henchman Number 7. That actually is one of my favorite things about it. Uh, taking seriously that people who live in this world will be affected by it in the following ways, and here's what makes that interesting, is one of the things I think the series does really well. And specifically the book series, too. Hmm? Olive Sheriff says, we will always be with Bonez. The mind is infinite, so yes. Arya Flame loves Ohm's reaction to the old temple. I love that. It is a, a place that promises the first safety in so long for Brother and is just absolutely terrifying to Ohm. Buffy Butt says, the books are leaking. I don't know what they mean, but they do. It's so many good quotes. Let's see, I wrote down a couple of my favorites. Hmm? Mm. Ah, okay. The first one I wrote down is, that's how they do things in ethics, is it? Says, said Ohm sarcastically. I don't know. It's how I'm doing it. Uh. <laughs> and the sequence where they're coming towards the lion. What was that? Definitely not a skull, lied Ohm. Don't worry. <laughs> Slightly lions? <laughs> Only one. Yeah, they switch where Om is enthusiastically encouraging him to bring Vorbis. Uh. There's bones everywhere. Well, what did you expect? This is a desert. People die here. It's a very popular occupation in this vicinity. There are so many good lines in this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oddly, 
oddly enough, there's also a tiny reference to this desert being formed by overgrazing and mismanagement of agriculture, which is a nice, relatively early call out to people's effect on the environment. I mean, environmentalism goes back much further than the 90s, but. Loves the sound of says the bit about the sparrow and the room. Wow. Genuine shudders there. Sather says, I mean, if we're doing Enthusiast Army cross comparisons, did anyone else think about Untitled Goose with the unnamed boat? I love that unnamed boat because of the name of the boat. Aleph Sharp says, I love the contrast between Ohm's reaction to the old temple and his reaction to the gravestone, explaining his perspective in a way. Almost better than the question where Brother asks his thoughts on humans. Starpilot6 says, as a fan of wordplay, I loved Stedactylos looking at the arrows on the bows and saying that Vorbis had brought many points for him to consider. Ari Flame says, people like Vorbis made the stick so good, that's all the donkey ends up believing in. Shiny Marigold says, my favorite quote in this section was, just because you can explain it doesn't mean it's not still a miracle. Brother to Ohm. Zather says, I don't know why, but people arguing about what to name something is one of my favorite little things in storytelling. Also, the, the broad arc of this, Brother has found some companions for the first time. Uh, they don't all know what he's going on. He finds and loses them in this section. But the big team up with Didactylos and Urn uh, and Simony and the escape were quite thrilling. Uh... Yeah, and Star it loves the sound of a goose with Star Pilot 6. Oh, wow, yes. Didactylos brought the puns in this section. I will write you more bowls than you can imagine. It is a truly wonderful uh, encounter. All right. This means that next week is our final week of Small Gods. Our first Discworld book for the We Declare Ourselves a Book Club book club. Uh, I'm so, so, so thrilled that I've gotten to do this with y'all. I'm having so much fun rereading it. And I love your thoughts. So next week, the big finish. Uh, we'll see if it all ends up totally fine. And bring your favorite parts, your big questions. And Mikey Glacey says, yay, I won't have to remember what are spoilers next week. Oh boy, oh man, says Farless. Squeeze, says Zather. Well, 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 says Fuffy Butt, which are, of course, the first words of the next section. Dark of Night says, spoiler alert, the total moves. Aleph Sharp is asking about what's next, uh, and I will decide on that next time. We'll have a short break between this and the next book because we always need to give people time to read. Uh... But I, ha I have to decide what's, what's, which of my candidates I think we're going with next on Book Club. We're probably not going to do back-to-back -back Pratchett, although I, I, if y'all are up for it, would love to return to Pratchett in future, obviously. John Newman looks forward to that VOD. Library list is very excited. Moobot is being mad at people for getting excited. Sorry about that. Kiki <laughs> Chappie says, all of Terry Pratchett is next. Aleph Sharp is requesting a graphic novel. If you have more suggestions, uh, well, I, I mean, I'm probably going to choose from a small things, but like general comments on what you're enjoying about Book Club or what you'd love to see next uh, would be a great thing to put in our community-run Discord, the Enthusiast Army Discord, uh, which I, I will pop in uh, and take a look at. Librarian Liz would love to return to Pratchett at some time. Aw, Mikey Glinsky says I could always use more examples to prove my initial preconceptions about Pratchett wrong. Mm -hmm. Morton says, back to Batchett Pratchett. Loves the sound of votes from Monstrous Regiment. If 
Violet says, yes, give me excuses to read. Seeing a suggestion for an ambitious double feature by combining this with American Gods. Interesting. Fluffy Butts uh, doing a reminder that I try, tr picking ones that have audiobooks can be very, very helpful. Hmm? All right. And with that. Oh. Actually, with this, which I love, from Heart of Hamperage, says, I've read all of the books for Book Club, and none of them are likely books that I would have picked up on my own. Love the broadening of my book horizons. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to hear that. It's been a, a mix of me picking things I've always wanted to read, things that are just coming on my radar, and uh, uh, things that I'm enjoying revisiting. And so far, selfishly, I'm having a great time, and I really appreciate all of you who are doing it with me. It makes it so much fun. Now... We're going to take a short break. Uh, thank you, my amazing book club, uh, for being here with me and doing this and spending this time. And after a short break, we've got some very scary decisions to make in King's Quest. Because I think we might be stuck. 